carbohydrates can ultimately be made into glucose, which is kind of the major energy source building block for our body. So today we want to look at this overall reaction of how somehow glucose is combined with oxygen and water, and that generates the mass of our body, and it also generates energy. And what is this energy anyway? So we breathe in oxygen, we breathe out CO2, and we also breathe out water vapor. But we want to look at the details of what happens to the oxygen that we breathe in. And where does the CO2 that we breathe out, where does this come from? And where does the water vapor come from? Is it the same water that we drank? And what is the form of the energy? This is kind of the mysterious process here. Somehow we make energy. And what does that really mean in biochemical terms? So sugar has a lot of energy. Food can be very explosive material. And one way to illustrate this is look at these silos in which food, in this case wheat, is stored as grain. And every year there are somewhere in the world these massive explosions of these grain silos. So many people have been killed in these kinds of silos and it's basically exploding food. And that's because if you combine finely ground wheat with oxygen and there's a spark or a cigarette nearby, you can get a massive explosion, a massive release of energy. So what happens in our body? Why, do we, I, why are we able to get the energy out in kind of small packets instead of just one big explosion? So we also looked at last time the fact that our body has our intestine, and that's where the basic processing of food initially occurs. And the walls of our intestines are lined with these specialized cells that have these long finger-like projections. And the reasons for these fingers is that it maximizes the amount of surface area. Because the way the food that's partially digested here gets into our bodies is being transported across this membrane. And there are many proteins in the membrane, very specific for what the cells take up. There are about several hundred different kinds just for sugars alone. So from the intestine, these sugars are taken up here, they go into this cell, and from this cell, then they can again be selectively transported across membranes and into lymph lymphatic vesicles or into blood vessels. And there they go to other parts of our body. And for food processing, much of this occurs in the liver and specifically inside the cells that make up our liver. So here's that kind of cartoon version of a cell, which shows all the principal components like the outer membrane and the nucleus where the genes are. But for looking at the metabolism of glucose, much of the chemistry that occurs, occurs out here in the sort of soupy area of the cell not inside any of these compartments, but just in this part we call the cytosol. And then another very important part occurs in this one type of intracellular structure, the mitochondrion. We're going to come back to describe that in a little bit more detail later. Okay, so what we have from decades of study is now a quite detailed map of all of the chemical reactions that occur in living organisms. And it's a quite overwhelming set of interconnected reactions. There are probably 20,000 different kinds of chemical reactions by which our protein, our carbohydrates, our fats, etc., get converted into other types of molecules and then fed into making structures or providing energy. Now, what we're going to look at, though, is the central part of this pathway. Notice right here, there's this big cycle, and there's a section that goes down and feeds into this cycle. That is the main metabolic route by which glucose gets metabolized. So, right in the center of all of these reactions, we have glucose right here. And then there are 10 enzymes that catalyze 10 different chemical reactions. Then they feed into this cycle of reactions, 
Okay, and all of this has as its main function getting energy out of the glucose that comes from our food. All right. This energy is primarily in the form of ATP, adenosine triphosphate. And it's a rather simple molecule. It's really like the gasoline of all living organisms. We use the energy in our food to make more ATP. And we use the ATP as the kind of direct chemical form of energy that does things like keeps all of our ions in balance, drives our nerve cells, allows us to walk across the room, allows us to build proteins, build cell walls, build blood vessels, etc. So let's look at the structure of this molecule in a little bit of detail. So the adenosine part of this is these two ring structures here. This is a simple sugar, a ribose sugar, and this is a nitrogen containing base that we call it. This is adenine and when you add the sugar you get adenosine. Then attached to this are three phosphate molecules surrounded by oxygens. And this is a kind of cartoon version of the same thing. And the way to think about why this is an energy molecule, one of the key aspects of it is note that these oxygens are negatively charged. And negative charges repel each other. They're pushed apart. Plus and minus attract, but minus and minus repel. What you have in ATP is basically a negatively charged phosphate and you have to use a chemical reaction somehow to force that phosphate to be bonded to the next phosphate. But it's almost like taking a spring and compressing the spring. By forcing these two things together, you start up energy in that chemical connection between those atoms. And with the appropriate trigger, that energy will be least released. The phosphates will push each other apart and that's what allows your muscles to move, your ions to be pumped, etc. Okay, so the big picture is that we're going to use glucose to make lots and lots of ATP. So this just shows this recycling of the ADP and the phosphate, the diphosphate plus phosphate, are put together to make the triphosphate, ATP. This then goes and is used by oh, hundreds of different types of enzymes in your body where the separation of these two phosphates provides energy to drive some chemical reaction or some mechanical movement and then you end up with the products. You have to keep making this all the time. In fact, you've only got enough ATP in your body to last you for about 45 seconds. In a really vigorous exercise mode, you're using nearly a pound of ATP a minute. Well, you don't lose a pound of weight. Why? Because you don't actually lose the molecule. You just take it apart and then within a few microseconds, put it back together again, reuse it, take it apart, put it back together again. This is what you're using that glucose for, to drive this synthesis of ATP. And we're gonna look at this in a little bit of detail. Okay, so, the title of this course is Food and Biochemistry, and today you're really going to get your money's worth on the biochemistry part. We're going to go into some detailed explanation of exactly how we take glucose apart in little pieces and make ATP. So, here are the first 10 steps involved in the metabolism of glucose. And we're not going to go through all of the details, but note that we start out with this six carbon sugar molecule. And what happens to it in the first part is we actually end up using a little bit of ATP to take it apart. That is, we take a phosphate from ATP and we attach it to one end of the sugar molecule. It gets rearranged a little bit and then we take another phosphate from another ATP and attach it to the other end of the sugar molecule. So now we have six carbons with these phosphates at the end. And what has happened here is that the addition of these phosphates and the fact that you've got all these oxygens with their hunger for electrons, it's really changing the electron configuration of the whole molecule here. 
and it's making it much more susceptible to being split into two parts. And that's what happens in the next step. There's an enzyme that binds this molecule and it splits it so you get this three carbon molecule and this three carbon molecule. So one six carbon glucose makes a pair of three carbon molecules here. Then you start harvesting the energy. And what you're really doing is harvesting these high energy electrons that are present in each of these atoms that are bound to the carbons and the carbon-carbon bonds themselves. So in step one, there's this rather complex reaction where we in fact take a, a regular phosphate, not in any high energy form, just plain phosphate, and we attach it to one end of the three carbon molecule. So we end up with a three carbon with a phosphate at one end and now a second phosphate at the other end. The other thing we do is we harvest a pair of electrons. And where these electrons go is on this very special carrier, NAD. And where this comes from, in our very first lecture where we talked about the Big Mac bond being enriched in one of the enriching elements was a vitamin niacin. Niacin is the source of the N in NAD. What this molecule does is it carries high energy electrons in a somewhat stable form and it's going to be essential to understanding how ATP gets made. So now we have these two phosphates, high energy phosphates, and we can use them to make ATP. So one of these phosphates gets put back on an ADP to make a, a, an a molecule of ATP. So now you've got three carbons with just one left. There's a little bit of a rearrangement here. Notice it gets moved from the end carbon up to the middle carbon. Take out a molecule of water. You make this very high energy molecule here. And this phosphate then can be converted to another molecule of ATP. So what you've ended up with is your six carbons in glucose have been split into a pair of three carbon molecules. You ended up investing two ATPs, but you get four out, and you've got a couple pairs of electrons that are now carried on this NAD molecule. Okay, so what we're gonna do next is look at the question of, well, what happens to these three carbons here? Because at this point, uh, let me look at, go back here. What I want to show you here is the fact that all of those reactions we just took a look at before are in the soupy part of the cell. But what's going to happen next now is we're going to move into this mitochondria. Okay, now let's look at that structure in a little bit of detail. In a way, it, it looks a little bit like a bacterium. And in fact, that is the evolutionary history of what this structure is. Every single liver cell in our body has about 2,000 of these. And we look at them carefully, it has some surprising features. Among other things, it has its own DNA. It has its own set of genes. It has its own protein manufacturing machinery. It has types of lipids in its membrane that are the type you find in bacteria, not in normal other parts of the human cell. And in fact, now decades of research has given substantial proof to an old hypothesis that in fact this structure, the mitochondrion, really at some ancient stage of evolution was a type of bacterium that was engulfed by a larger cell and the bacterium instead of being completely chewed up was in fact sort of co-opted for use by the larger cell as a way to convert its food into ATP and these reactions occur inside this structure. Okay, this is a movie that I took in the lab with the organism that we use, Neurospora, and these little green wormy things here, these are mitochondria. So this movie is speeded up a little bit, but not that much, maybe about five-fold, 
and you can see that the cell is just loaded with these, these structures because the cell has such a high need for ATP, it needs a lot of them to supply the cell's energy demand. Okay, so we look at it, this cartoon version of what a mitochondria looks like. There is an outer layer and then an inner layer, and there's a space between these two layers. This space turns out to be a key part of our story. Inside, there are some DNA molecules, there are some protein manufacturing machinery, and there are all the enzymes involved in the metabolic pathways we're going to look at next. Okay, so the three carbon molecule that we ended up with from glucose, when it's transported into the mitochondrion, the first thing that happens is that one of the carbons is cut off and produces a molecule of CO2. And the remaining two carbons come into this cycle of reactions inside the mitochondrion. All right, so in terms of where does the CO2 come from, we now know where one of them comes from. All right. So what we're ended up with here is a pair of carbons, and that is put on a carrier that has four carbons itself. So two carbons plus four carbons makes six carbons. And on this carrier then, the electrons are harvested from the atoms in this molecule. So one of the first steps is one of these carbons is split off to produce yet another molecule of CO2. And you take a pair of electrons and make a molecule of NADH. Then in the next step, another carbon is split off to make yet another CO2. And you take another pair of electrons and make NADH. So we split glucose into a pair of three carbon molecules. And then all three of those carbons ended up as CO2s. The first step when it ended minus entered the mitochondria, one CO2, second CO2, third CO2. So all of the carbon and the glucose we eat goes off as CO2. All right. Now, at this point, there's still actually a few electrons from that original glucose being carried on this carrier molecule. And we harvest those pair of electrons. Another step here, flavin is the core of a molecule that can be a carrier. And the flavin we encountered also in the Big Mac bun is yet another vitamin, riboflavin. And this is one of the reasons why you need it. You need it for the generation of energy from glucose. And then there's a final pair of electrons that you get to make an NADH up here at the end. So the bottom line of this is, is that the three carbons that we got from the reactions out in the soupy part of the cell come in, the carbons themselves end up as CO2 and the electrons that were on those atoms end up on these carrier molecules in their NADH or FADH2. Okay, so let's summarize where we stand then with this metabolic pathway. So glucose, C6H12O6, ends up partly degraded into six CO2s. But what happens to all of these hydrogen atoms and their electrons? Okay. The hydrogen atoms, the H plus and the electrons, are now on NADH. Now we also saw that in the very first step out in the cytosol that there were four ATPs that were made. However, Glucose metabolism, we know, produces many more ATPs. So, somehow, these electrons here have to be used to make more ATPs. And the other thing is that we haven't seen anywhere in any of these reactions any oxygen being used. The CO2 here it, uh, came from either water or from the original O2 in the glucose molecule. So where does oxygen come into play here, if it's so important? All right, well, as I said, most of the ATP is made inside the mitochondria, and it's reactions that occur, especially in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. 
Okay. And we can simplify it in the following way. This is actually a very complex series of molecular events. And exactly how this happened really drove biochemists crazy for a couple of decades. And the reason was that they saw that there were enzymes out there in the cell that were capable of making ATP just from molecules that you could mix together in a test tube. There was no magic about it. Those 10 steps that produce the 6-carbon glucose and converted it to a pair of 3-carbon molecules, they produced ATPs. So they kept looking for phosphate-containing molecules that could be the source of transferring it to ADP to make ATP, but they just could not find them. But finally, another guy who was in a completely different field, who worked in the question of how molecules are transported across membranes, this man's name was Peter Mitchell, came up with a hypothesis that explained it, but it was a completely different way of doing chemistry. So, what we have here is just a cartoon version of the outer membrane of the mitochondria and the inner membrane of the mitochondria. And what we now know is that what we have here are not a series of enzymes in which you convert A molecule A into molecule B. These are simply pumps that take a proton, H+, and move it from the inside of the mitochondrion across this membrane to this space between the inner and the outer membrane. So, the way these pumps work is step one, you have NADH with a pair of electrons. And so you can think of this as an electrically driven pump. Just as you would buy a pump at home and plug it into the wall and the motor would turn on and it would pump water from one side of the pump to the other. In this case, instead of plugging it into the wall, you bind it to an NADH molecule. The NADH molecule provides an electron. The electron goes from one site on this protein and travels through to some electron acceptor on the other side. And the flow of that current, and it's going downhill, it's losing energy as it does this, is coupled to picking up a proton on one side and moving across the membrane. And it turns out there's enough energy in these electrons to go through three different pumps. There's one here that pumps protons, there's another one here that pumps protons, and there's a third one here that pumps protons. And where do these electrons finally end up when they have almost no energy? Who wants an old, worn-out electron with no energy left to it? And the answer is oxygen. <laughs> Oxygen has such a high affinity, such a high desire for electrons that it will grab them at the end of this long series of chemical reactions. And this is why oxygen is essential for life. This is the kind of end of the road for that glucose molecule. And oxygen, in a way, makes the whole thing go. Because when oxygen takes an electron off of this protein here, it allows a space in that protein for a new electron to be filled from this protein. And when that passes its electron on, then that allows a space for electron to be passed on for this protein, and ultimately from these electrons that are carried by NADH and were obtained from glucose. So now, what have we achieved? What we've done here is to accumulate protons in this space between the membranes and also accumulate positive charge. So we have two types of gradients here. We have a chemical gradient, a lot of H's up here, a few down here, and we have an electrical gradient, plus charge out here and minus charge here. So that gives us a form of energy, a driving force. These protons want, if you will, to go inside, they're attracted electrically, and there's just a lot of them here, a few of them here. So, if they can find a way across the membrane, they will go to the inside. The cell provides a way across the membrane with this very complex protein here, such that when they move 
from this high concentration to this low concentration, the energy lost in that step can be used to put energy into the bond between ADP and phosphate. That is how you make ATP. So let me show you how this works. So there's two parts to this enzyme. The first one has a channel that protons can cross the membrane. And when going through this channel, they actually generate a rotary force. And the second part is the site where ATP, ADP, and phosphate bind, and that chemistry takes place. So let's look at the proton channel part first. So this is a cartoon version of how that works. So this is that space between the membranes. It's flipped over from the way I showed it in the previous diagram. But all the protons are accumulating out here and they can move halfway through the membrane attracted to these minus charges on the protein. And when they bind to these minus charges, they cause this whole rotary shaped protein to move in a circle. And they can ride around this protein until they come to the other half of the channel, which is in contact with the other space here that's low in protons, high in negative charges, and they hop off of this and go to, through to the other side. So this is the essence of the, uh, where the energy in those NADH electrons go. They used to make this proton gradient, and the proton gradient drives the rotary motion of this protein. Okay, now that rotary motion that we saw before. In this uh, uh, illustration here is showing how it results in this central part of the enzyme spinning around a central axis. So this enzyme is quite complex. It has three different binding sites for making ATP. One here, one here, one here. And then three other protein components that are sort of part of the structure, part of the regulatory element in the protein. And so the way ATP is actually made is by opening up a pocket between the red part of the protein and the green part of the protein. Now we can see this a little easy, more easily if we take this thing and I'm going to turn it up like this. So now we see that up here the protons are going through and they're causing this to rotate. You notice that this is rather lumpy, so as it pushes against this part of the protein over here in red, it causes it to swing one way and then it swings back. And when it does that, it opens up this pocket right here. ADP phosphate go in, it closes, ATP is formed, it opens, ATP comes off and more ADP and phosphate go in. And so that is occurring at a rate of about 400 per second. And what that means is that this thing is spinning at nearly 10,000 RPM. So that's why we have such a, a high need for making lots of ATP, because we use it at such a high rate. As I mentioned, we have enough ATP only to last us for about 45 seconds, but we can survive because these enzymes are producing the ATP 400 per second for every enzyme in your body. And when you think about the fact that there, your liver has billions of cells, and each of those cells has 4,000 mitochondria, and each of those mitochondria has probably is in the neighborhood of 500,000 of these ATP synthesizing machines. You can understand how we can make ATP at such a high rate. Okay, so where we end up with at the end of glucose metabolism then is the glucose molecule, six carbons, 12 hydrogens, and six oxygens, combines with six O2s to give you six carbon dioxides and six water molecules. And we now see that this water here 
is not just the water that we drink, it's actually the water that we chemically made using electrons and protons from glucose to combine with the oxygen that we breathe in. And this process is coupled to the production of 36 ATPs for every one glucose molecule. Okay, now the fact that oxygen is so reactive though has another, has a problem, uh, creates a problem for the cells and that is Besides being able to drive all this metabolism, oxygen is reactive enough to react in places where you don't want it to react. It can be, be damaging. And because of that, organisms have evolved ways of dealing with these toxic forms of oxygen. And these molecules that we make to deal with this toxic oxygen are called antioxidants. They prevent the oxidation, the unwanted combination of oxygen with other molecules. Okay, so things like carrots, garlic, lemon, etc., they each have their own particular types of molecules that function as antioxidants. So, for example, you've probably heard about this resveratrol, which is wine, and it is made in grapes. Okay, so how do these molecules function? Well, so the basic problem here is that oxygen can take this arrangement of electrons, which allows it to pick up an electron, an extra electron, and makes what is called a superoxide radical. And this is a highly reactive form of oxygen. It will react with whatever is nearby. It could be a protein. It could be a DNA molecule causing a mutation in your genome. It could be a lipid causing changes in the, in the lipid structure of the layers of tissue in your eyes. So this is something that is really dangerous for cells. Now we know that this is a real problem in part because we found that virtually all organisms have evolved ways to deal with it. And all cells make proteins, function as enzymes, whose job it is to inactivate these oxygen radicals. Okay, so this is why you often see food labeled as rich in antioxidants with the idea that or it will obviously be good for you then, right? Alright, so one of the antioxidants that we can get in our diet is vitamin E. And this just shows briefly how it works. So the problem here is this form of oxygen just represented as X with an, this extra electron. And this electron can be effectively neutralized if, if, it be, be con, if it can be combined with H plus from a different molecule. So the vitamin E has this reactive hydrogen right here. And so you combine this molecule with a reactive oxygen and this H plus combines with the electron to generate, see it's gone here, and the electron is transferred to a form that is less reactive and less dangerous to cells. All right, so again, you might think that these antioxidants, therefore, are definitely a good thing, and this has been examined uh, quite a bit by biochemists. So one way they have looked at this uh, is exploring the hypothesis that what causes aging may be the accumulation of damage, the inevitable damage that comes, about, comes from the fact that we need oxygen and so we generate the superoxide radical all the time. So one way that we tested this is by looking at different organisms and seeing if we change the amount of superoxide or change the amount of antioxidants, does it affect the life expectancy of the organism? Now, is, this would be nearly impossible to do in humans because you really can't do the control experiments and because we have a long life expectancy. Or even mice. Mice live about two years and it's difficult to do an experiment with thousands of mice. It's just, 
so expensive is to be impractical. So one way that this has been examined is to use these little worms called C. elegans. They only have a life expectancy of typically about 30 days and you can grow tens of thousands of them in a small area rather cheaply. Now, when they look at what happens if you manipulate the way the cell deals with these superoxide radicals, you find this following interesting and unexpected result. So in one experiment, they changed the DNA in the worms so such that what they effectively did is to get rid of some of the enzymes that would destroy the superoxide. And the effect that was that these organisms had high levels of these free radicals, this dangerous form of oxygen. And what they expected was that this, they would be very sick and they would die young. But in fact, just the opposite happened. Whereas the normal worm would grow about 28 days, the mutant worms could grow up to 50 days. It in fact expanded their life expectancy. Well, what would happen if you used these antioxidants? You added a lot of antioxidants to the food. The antioxidants should be a good thing, right? Well, if you have these mutant worms and you feed them high levels of antioxidants, in fact, you wipe out this uh, effect of increasing longevity. So these are mutant worms given antioxidants and it brings their life expectancy back to zero. So this was a real puzzle and we still don't really understand how this works, but I'm going to tell you about one hypothesis that's getting a lot of investigation these days. So it's being looked at because a lot of dietary studies have been done looking at the effect of antioxidants on humans and a lot of other creatures. And what I'm showing here is results from a publication in which they looked at 68 different scientific studies. They kind of pulled out the 47 that they thought had the best controls, the best data in them. And then they just plot them here for what was the effect of the antioxidants. Did it lower the rate of mortality, meaning lower death rate, the organisms lived longer over here, or did they actually see a higher rate of mortality in which their life was shortened, as you see over here? And the, the surprise is that among the big majority of these studies, what you see is that the effect of increasing the amount of antioxidants in the diet was a higher death rate. It actually is not beneficial. It seems to be a real source of problems, a source of shortened longevity. So what's going on? How to explain this? Okay, so the hypothesis is that we have, as animals, have had to deal with the fact that our food supply, mostly plants initially, is loaded with toxins, naturally produced insecticides. So plants have, for millions of years, tried to avoid being insect eaten by insects and other organisms. And one way they do this is to by producing organic compounds, complex chemical structures, that are toxic to animals, all right? And all of the plants and plant products that you see here produce literally thousands of different kinds of these natural insecticides, some of which are antioxidants. Now, we've been eating those for tens of thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years, and we have evolved ways to deal with the fact that we're eating a lot of poisons. All right, we have enzymes that inactivate them and we avoid taking them up. There are a variety of defense mechanisms. So the hypothesis that's a, emerging is that these antioxidants are recognized by our cells as uh, potentially poison compounds and the response is to activate our defense systems 
to turn on the synthesis of enzymes that will either destroy them or transport them out of the cell. So, if you look at certain toxic chemicals that we know are just poison, something like arsenic or cyanide or something, you find that at very low levels it will have no effect until you reach some critical threshold in which giving a higher and higher dose of this toxin will result in a, a larger and larger lethality to the organism. On the other hand, it's found that for many of these antibiotics and other naturally produced uh, toxins, at first there is no effect, but then when you reach the threshold, you actually seem to see a positive effect. In some cases, an elongation of the, of the um, of elongation of survival. Organisms will grow longer if they get a little bit of these toxins. But then you reach some peak at which adding more and more and more gives you less and less benefit and finally you cross a line where it's more toxic for you than it's good for you and in excessively high doses can actually be very dangerous indeed. So what people think is going on here is that in this range what you're doing, the reason why it's good for you is because it's just enough of a poison to turn on all of your natural defense mechanisms. So the cell sees the toxin as a signal. The signal says, all right, food's coming in, but it's got some bad things in it. We need to inactivate it, and so turn on the enzymes that do that job. And with an elevated defense system, you're able to survive for a longer period of time. Okay, so where we stand today is not a very thorough understanding of how antioxidants work. It seems clear that unless your doctor has said you should do it, I would avoid taking them as supplements. And the best way to get the right mix of nutrients and antioxidants is not by taking it out of a bottle, but by eating the plants themselves. Because these plants have a mixture of nutrients, sugars, fats, lipids that we need in our diet mixed in there with a fair number of natural products that will be recognized by our body and we will activate this, the defense mechanism that we need to deal with them. So we're going to stop there for this lecture and in the next lecture we're going to be talking about two of our other favorite types of food. We're talking about fats and protein. Thank you.